I'm Ian Tatham. I run uh, Well Plastic, which is a design company down the road, and we've done some videos for UDJ. Uh, I'm Tom Miller. I'm a graphic designer. I'm just doing my own thing. Uh, I'm Dylan Kendall. I'm a partner of the, the collective Tomato. Um, I am a graphic designer and a director, I suppose. Amongst other things. No. Not multidisciplinary, though. <laughs> So I think um, one of the first things, and I think maybe something that hasn't been touched upon, and this is sort of bringing it back from all uh, your point of view, really, as students, is that I mean, maybe getting more of an insight as to what all of your backgrounds are, really. And uh, I know Ian touched on it perhaps more than uh, Dylan and Tom, but where you started, where where it all began um, for you. Well, I kind of... It, 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 it's always been in, in my family kind of thing. I mean, my parents were interior designers. My uncle is an architect. My cousin is a sculptor. My brother does 3D um, design. Uh, I had uncles that were into fine art, like local councils, um, did like uh, architects as well, like build like town planning and everything. So I kind of grew up in this whole artist design slash environment so I, I guess for me it was a very natural progression to end up doing what I'm doing now I don't think I would have ended up being an accountant or um, I think my parents were kind of um, dissuading me from that direction they were like if you want to do something interesting like maybe chemistry or science or math where there's like a bit of creative thinking go for it accounting not so much but I mean, I think my dad had a really, um, I think he's, a lot of parents have, have that kind of dream that, you know, because he, he had his own design practice, that he would kind of hand it over to me when he would retire, but then I decided to go into design, um, and yeah, that's kind of, I mean, how I ended up being a designer. There wasn't really a very, like, laid out plan, it just kind of it was it seemed very normal to me to just like go and do design it was your destiny i don't want to i would want don't want to put it that heavy but it was it, i mean a lot of my friends kind of who are designers kind of discovered it when they were teenagers and they like you yeah. know you discover music and all of a sudden you go like shit this is cool i, I want to do this and to me when i was when i was a toddler I would like you know hang out in my dad's studio and I would have like my uh, Sesame Street comics and my dad would have um, no catalogs designed by Mas Massimo Vignelli and like he would go on and talk about it. and this is what this is what Bauhaus used to do and to me at what kind age? Of, well, five, yeah, Bauhaus, yeah when five. I was it, it, it just became like you know I was sitting I was sitting on, at a desk here in his in his studio drawing he would be working and you know I just these books and everything was just there for me to to absorb so I don't think um, I never really questioned not doing anything design related you you're a product of being shaped by your surroundings I guess so I mean I, I tried to I tried to do product design before I switched to graphic design because that was kind of what my dad was doing but um, they the, the, the course I did in Antwerp had just really really high standards of like maths and science classes and physics and you know you had to be able to calculate the velocity of things and how a car would work and that kind of stuff and I was just no I'll just I'll design a nice shape engine wise I don't know just whatever so that's how I, I decided to I kind of bailed out on product design and graphic design was you know the next solution the next step I think um Maybe you've got something interesting to say about your what we were talking about earlier in terms of your educational background before you join Tomato. Well, <clears throat> there's some there are some similarities um, to Tom in that my father was a graphic designer. Um, my stepfather was a well, he was many things. Um, um, I mean, he was a writer and a media studies lecturer. Um, and so I guess there were some some similarities in that um, my dad didn't have his own practice. He was he um, actually did mostly paste up um, because he had me when he was really young. He had me when he was twenty, and paste up paid more than graphic design. 
did at the time. So he would work um, all hours got sent to keep us in nappies and whatever it was that we were getting through at whatever rate. Um, so for me, uh, you know, with the uh, sort of a, a, a small window uh, where I wanted to be like a fighter pilot or Royal Marine, um, which was very small window, um, I always kind of wanted to do uh, design too. Um, and <clears throat> for me, the my sort of first struggle was whether I did because um, I always I, I just love drawing uh, was whether I was going to do fine art or whether I was going to do uh, graphic design and my father is very much the pragmatist and said you'll never make any money as a fine artist <laughs> my stepfather was the media lecturer dreamer said follow your heart do fine art so <laughs> I probably did the only thing you know I, I, it would be wrong to kind of go with one against the other, so I found the loosest graphic design course that I could, which was Camberwell, that had a very kind of strong illustration. It didn't teach you anything about graphic design. It didn't teach me anything about graphic design. Um, you know, I didn't... Not that I can remember, anyway. Um, there, at, the, at the point at which I started really playing with graphic design, I suppose, in the, the way that we're understanding it, um, was actually a falling out I had with my um, the head of course where she basically said you're not illustrating anything else well you put anything in front of me I'll, I'll draw it and she goes that's not illustration so I stopped drawing and just started writing stuff and said that's that's a different type <laughs> that's so that's design is it and that kind of I, I kind of um, that was sort of my baptism of fire I suppose it's very it? clear in your work though that well, how fine art influenced it is and the whole use of mark yeah. making and how much it comes through in, in your work and even right through to filming something you have an artistic approach to your work yeah. uh, it's quite clear in the work you were showing and some of the work that you did very early on as well I mean going back as far back as it's 94, 95 Five with train spotting, and yeah. I don't know if anybody's seen. Has anybody seen train spotting? Yeah, are we familiar with the title? The very, very quick title sequence, which comes up, you know, in maybe five seconds, and it's, it's literally seconds, train yeah. spotting, and it's in the sound of the train. Probably, arguably, one of the most famous title sequences. That was Dylan's first job at Tomato. All that time, not ago. on my own, on your own. No. But, but how much? But there was two of us. Sorry. Tell, so, tell the story. <laughs> okay, so um, I had uh, okay, so um, I left. I went to to master pretty much straight from college. Um, I was very fortunate, and I'd had one work placement before, which was at ID magazine. Um, I was drinking in the right pubs um, to meet the right people and having the right conversations. I had, uh, you know, I would uh, take my sketchbook into the pub so that I had something to show. You know, just so happens I had something to. Ch to show and so yeah I got uh, basically I, I after I graduated um, in the, the summer holidays I was asked to go and help um, contribute some artwork for an underworld video um, and then not long after that um, basically I was uh, given a full-time position um, and train spotting was being done. Uh, Underworld had, were doing the sort of the main title track for it, I suppose, which uh, was uh, Born Slippy, which is the Lager, Lager, Lager um, song. Do you know it? Catchy, catchy lyrics. Um, and they needed, they needed uh, Danny Boyle, who, and this was, I think, his second film then, needed a title sequence. Uh, they had 250 quid for it. Um, and there were three of us actually that worked on it. There was uh, Jason, Kedgley, um Tom Root, who's now yeah. at um, Sweet Shop, yeah. um, and myself. And we basically we the animation was devised on Director, which is an old piece of um, programming. Um, it's a programming interface, isn't it? Really, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so the animation was done on that, it was printed out frame by frame, so there were uh, 250 frames because it's 10 seconds, and um, 
actually less, sorry, I'll tell a lie. 240 frames. This film runs at 24. Um, and so we printed, the, printed each frame out and then we faxed each frame um, because that was the filter we were using. The sort of thermal fax gives it a kind of slightly smacky colour, which is, was t related back to the kind of storyline, plot line, and the sort of the needle marks. So it was supposed to be both needle marks and train tracks. Unfortunately, the um, unfortunately the fax was so, uh, distorted each frame so much that we could never get a decent registration. We got some really beautiful moving image, but it was not legible. It was never legible. So we had to recreate it in about an hour, having spent a week, two weeks, running between the Rostrum House and the fax, and you know, it was a week of uh, two weeks of long long nights, late nights. Um, so yeah, two hundred fifty quid. Um, not a lot of money. Um, my ex-girlfriend, who's a f photo agent, actually managed the photographer who took the pictures, you know, f of the characters from Trainspotting. So um, and they were ripped off by, is it French Connection News? Everyone was mm. using. They were on mugs. They were every yeah. everywhere. And he was a clever boy. He paid for the shoot himself, and he kept the rights. So uh, iconic in its own right. Yeah. Though, oh, it's, it's, it's yeah. 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 Um, so he kept the rights to it. Now we reckon it's always a, it's a joke and a tired one for me, but you won't have heard it. I reckon with his the money that he made from the rights for the photography for train spying, he was able to buy a villa in Notting Hill, um, and we just about got a round in the uh, in the pub with a packet of peanuts. But um, it's kind of interesting. It's like it, you look at it, it, it is kind of iconic. Um, it's that moment. Of, time isn't it um, yeah and but I think it's tied it's tied in with the you know it's, it, it's it's the package it's the whole package um, and, yeah. it's right place right time it was um, around that time you get got the likes of Kyle Cooper and well we were we yeah I mean we were effects. you were it was the same year as yeah. well actually That's Kyle seven. Cooper requested our reel before <laughs> seven um, um, so but still so, RGA back then. Yeah. So um, actually, that year we were nominated for Designer of the Year, as was oh, he, I think. Mm. So. Interesting. Is anybody familiar with Carl Cooper? If you're not, you, be, you need to be looking his work up. Carl um, Cooper created probably his most infamous piece of work, is um, the seven title sequences, which is a, a little mini film in its own right, and it's beautifully macabre. and really does symbolise and summarise the what the film's about and um, he's gone on to do, um, it's, uh, opened up Imaginary Forces which I think is his agency now and he's done more, far more commercial work like Spider-Man and yeah. um, I think he's done a lot of Marvel stuff actually. Yeah. Really it's a huge, huge company so worth looking at them. The interesting thing about Seven, because the titles to Seven are, are iconic and I've argued yeah. some of the best titles ever, but I don't actually think he didn't do the filmmaking. He just did the, as far as I'm aware, David Fincher directed, yeah. the, so directed, directed the footage. Yeah. Right. Um, but Carl Cooper, they did kind of crazy stuff like they would, uh, they dragged they dragged the print yeah. around the desert um, and yeah, to yeah, kind yeah. of create the texture. And even it. all like the notebooks and everything are yeah. all meticulously made, aren't they? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's a, it's yeah, a, the it's a, it's a fantastic. Thing. But then you look at Fincher's later titles for like Panic Room. Mm. Where he kind of references the north by northwest, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. you know, it's in, mm. you know, his 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 eyes. Burst, he's versatile. Yeah. Yeah. And um, obviously, David Fincher started off with um, Madonna, not director Madonna music videos. Vogue, is it Vogue? I'm sure that's well, one of the most really well known. Three, ones, isn't it? Yeah. Which was like so if you've seen that on MTV, three, you get a, he took a over film over director three, that yeah, goes yeah. from that to you know making quite macabre serial killer films to then doing something like Benjamin Button. The films he's but been he, um, Carl Cooper started. I think he left Imaginary Forces, and he's got Prologue. The creative director. Yeah, yeah, he's got Prologue now. It's another studio, and oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, one of his leads. Karen Fong. No, where's Fong? Um, the guy who did like the title sequences for Oblivion. Um, That's right. Very new creative director. There's an interview on. Um, 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 uh, I don't know who you mean. <laughs> 
anyway, prologue.com, they've got worth like, looking at, definitely. Well, the art of the title as well. Kind yes, of, yeah. It's a good website if you're into that sort of stuff. But I mean, if we're looking at Ian's work as well, which you've just seen, and you know, how you've gone from something which is as two dimensional as you get in terms of the style that arguably 1210, and maybe Designers Ripple Glitter was even more of a kind of style, but with 1210 it was that vector approach to things, and it was hugely, hugely popular. I'm sure Ian had so many people like ripping off that, that style, and it, it did, it became very distinctive so I mean if you've not seen 1210's work you probably have seen 1210's work without knowing about it um, because it's got a very slick stripped down kind of sort of interface influence to it I know Ian didn't have got many slides of that it. on there but it does, <laughs> it's like, it doesn't want anything to do it doesn't want to be reminded of yeah. Is it just all keep on, moving on, just keep moving on. All on jazz drive. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what was interesting, what, I mean, when you came in about four years ago and you were showing that, um, you know, when Ian was taking on um, people through work experience or there was a downtime in the company, it would literally be designing bits for the bar, really, wasn't it? And you'd be like, right, there you go, design a uh, mural or design the uh, yeah, well, menu. Was, I've always liked being my own client and mm. that... It's, it's easier, and it's it, the worst. It does actually, well, it does. It means <laughs> it means what you do straight out of your head is the right thing because you are the client and you know what it is you want, so you get it right. Because, and, and I've enjoyed that, and I've I've re, I've applied that back when working with clients of trying to put myself in their shoes. Certainly, yeah. when I'm thinking, what would. I'm not thinking what would I do for them as a designer, I'm thinking what is it they want and then I go to the designer like I'm now the client. So rather than the client, because when we were at 1210 we, had a, we, we almost operated like a, a doctor's surgery. We were down the bottom end and people, local promoters, business people, they, they'd come in, take a seat and then come in and sit with the designer. So whoever right. it was, they would sit with them and it, and it worked and it was kind of, it didn't, it didn't feel wrong and then when it went wrong it was no one wanted to speak to anyone. It was kind of like then everything had to come through me. But it was kind of so you had that approach then with most projects then where they would literally come in and you were quite happy to sit down and have them. We didn't really think. I've never so. worked for anyone, probably at all. So I don't really know how. I still don't know how a design company is supposed to work. And as I've proved, I have no idea how a video company is supposed to work either. So I just get on and do something that the end product keeps everyone happy, including myself, if possible. I mean, obviously, you can see my face when we're listening to Carrie. You may have bitten off more than I could chew there. But yeah, we, we just operated like that. It didn't work after a while, but for a while it worked. And it was kind of like people, other designers would sort of come in and go, this is just not, I could never do that. But I only, I employed personable designers mm. that would speak. Mm. They all went off and formed Studio Output <laughs> because they were really good at that. And they all kind of, they all sort of went, we could do this, couldn't we? And by then I was so busy getting drunk every night down at my own bar. So I was just kind of like rocking up at lunchtime. I'm going to call them Dr. Dan and Dr. Cook from now on. I think we, it's quite funny how we had the studio, we, had studio output come in a couple of times and it's like two of our next speakers have got this this uh, link to them in some in some way shape or form it's a very small world it is it, it the is design, I think yeah. That, yeah design industry can be a very very small world georgia yeah What agency is it? Huh? What agency? It's Microsoft. Uh, but they're in. That's, that's not really. That's, I wouldn't mm, say that's the, a design agency. Yeah, they're, that's they're, like they're in they're house. Global, like they're globalised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mm. 
but they said you can't. What was that? They yeah. can't. You can't work for anyone else because they're influencing your ideas. I have never in my life heard that. How long is the clause? Is it like, is it like one of those you cannot work or do or say anything for six months before you go to someone else? Have you signed something, Georgia? You haven't signed anything, have you? It's understandable they don't want you to do freelancing work. I could see why they would, because they, they, they want but your best work, mm. not you to be able to pin bit. Are you people. going in there as in a, as a in a position or as an intern? As a position. Well, I th then you've applied at the wrong time, I think. You've got there a bit too early, but you want you want to. I'm about to say you really want to finish your course, and I'm just thinking in my head I didn't finish mine, but um, I do everything the right way. Well, no, but if they're keeping in the position open for you and you and come June when you have actually finished, if they actually said to you, right, we want you to start in July, have they said anything? Right. Is you, it, you need more of a kind of dialogue with them in terms of, right, when would I start then? Because I think I think that just depends on person from person to person. Because I started... I mean, I you had it's that's almost like the golden the the holy grail with a lot of design students, I think, are aiming for is like you graduate and you immediately like fall into like the perfect spot if an agency a collective you can set up your own shop whatever but it's you, I think my wife has the same kind of luck like immediately starting to work with an agency and right after out of college and she's still there but it doesn't really matter like if you start on like a 20,000 um, people company and then in five ten years time you end up doing your own thing or set up an own practice or the other way around it just depends on how you what you want to do I mean I would I would say going back to what you just said I, I would I, I definitely uh, could have done with uh, I was sort of chucked in at the deep end and I think that there are some, yeah. there, there are some, uh, there's quite a lot of arguments against that. Uh, I don't think whether it would happen now anyway. What, what do you mean, like being chucked into the deep end? Or? Well, I, I mean, I had my own clients within like two months or yeah. three months, um, which was, it was it's very a good, trusting. It's a good and a bad thing at the yeah, same time. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think you've, I, don't th I think you need to be around those kind of relationships to understand the, um, the mechanics of yeah. it. Um, and I would say, for me, with your question about Microsoft, it would be more whether you were entering the kind of sector that you thought was appropriate for you, mm. rather than the scale of the company. Yeah. You know, what, were you, what, is your, what is your kind of path through it? Okay, you don't, need to know, you don't need to know the end game, but you need to know the first couple of steps, because in those bigger companies, it, it will so take longer to get there. You yeah. won't get, you won't get um, access to jobs and maybe the sorts of work you want to do want to yeah. as you might with, a, big, with a bit with a smaller with, yeah with a smaller company mm. you know the smaller company you get to see you get to see that the, the industry in, in microcosm whereas in a bigger company you'll just be seeing more of the same shit yeah if you don't if it, yeah you'll be you, There's always a chance you of becoming that, yeah. a number in one of those big scenarios, and you'll be, you'll learn a lot of like technical stuff and like rules and how to do things, mm -hmm. which you know might not necessarily be a good thing, but I guess I, I, I guess the argument is that you know um, if you you know what, what Dylan was saying you either start off like get chucked into the deep end and do everything yourself and learn through mistakes or you go through like the very through all the red tape and you learn it from that side and then you can still decide this is not for me and you know find your way but I don't think either way it would be a wasted opportunity if you get the offer but I don't think it's worth leaving college for no, unless, no. Uh, unless it's it was last year because you it was at the uh, new designers exhibit and you were approached weren't you um, you made a decision to stay but you know you're in touch with them and they're saying that the job is there if yeah. you keep that conversation open with them yeah. and be 
then, then if they did like you, whatever it is that they liked about you, they'll still like about you, mm. and you'll be should be better despite what they said. They they're probably they may be trying to scare you into it, yeah. so you don't go somewhere else. Yeah. Which you know maybe what you do, but I mean working somewhere like I mean I couldn't I wouldn't last a fortnight. I wouldn't last two days. I had a fortnight. Um, <laughs> but but if it's a, if you are I mean I'm not an organised person. But if you what? are, I know, I know. But if you are, places like that, you will, you will make contacts, you will develop different skills to perhaps being, you know, you've got, th these guys here are supremely creative. And I'm not saying you won't get to be creative, but you'll probably learn other complementary skills that they probably wouldn't learn, and I certainly haven't learned at all, um, doing what we do. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different approach, and it might suit you. Or like it would scare the living hell out of me, so I wouldn't touch you with the barge pole. But I would recommend to people: you don't turn down jobs at places like that. I wouldn't say you know it's you don't have to live there forever. And the people you meet there, they're, they're not going to be employing other idiots, unlike the people who work at Sony. But um, you, you, you're going to be meeting people, and those people are going to be the best at certain things, and you'll make contacts there. We've got a client now who they, they all used to work for Microsoft and now they run some god boring software company. But it's, um, you know, they all met at Microsoft and they're all at the top of the game and they're trying to build this company to, up to be worth, I think, four to six million pounds so they can all retire. But they are, they're making a, a shed load of money and it's what they want to do. But it's all been learned through Microsoft and they've got plenty of stories to tell, good and bad. Good, good, some some bad ones where they've been ripped off massively within the company, but they've come out the other end. You know, they've learned, they've grown as, as human beings. I also don't think it stops you. You know, you you know you've got an open door. The aim is to keep that one open, yeah. but see what other ones you can knock on and find out. You know, whether that you've got opportunities there. Yeah. Because I would say if somebody like that is sniffing around, then the it's chances good are there's gonna, that you know you, there's yeah. going to be people, other people that are going to be interested. I think um, still on the topic of getting a job, and when you're, uh, you know, when you've graduated and you're looking for work, I mean, what do you think it boils down to? Portfolio or at, or attitude? Do you think it's it's got it's, it's, it's got to be it's got to be a bit of both because I've employed people who have got very good portfolios that I've wanted to strangle within a, within a fortnight. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know, I, I, all I'm thinking is how the hell am I going to get this person? Because I'm really rubbish at sacking people, so what I do is manipulate them out. You pass it in. <laughs> Constructive <laughs> dismissal. <laughs> this is, day is that we can now go down the stairs. I'm yeah. going to get into trouble. But yeah, no, it's. Um, I'm not going to go into what I do, but. Um, <laughs> but, but, no, but yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I do everything by the book. But. Um, yeah, I, I've got people who've come to work for me who haven't got brilliant portfolios, but their attitude is absolutely brilliant, and they cannot work hard enough, and they cannot put the hours in. They have to have something. You have to see something, but their portfolio may not be polished. In a, I mean, Dan Moore, who runs Output now, he was, he'd done a fine art degree at Derby, and he was a painter and decorator, and his best mate ran um, a record label um, who he could have been doing their work for them, but they weren't, they were coming to us. But he said, he's got something, have a look at his stuff. And he was doing some flyers, he, he was doing them in freehand or something, and he clearly hadn't worked out that it was in a line tool, because everything was just out and wound me up a tree. But you could see he had a brilliant eye for image making, and he, and he had, he, despite not actually getting, you know, a training in graphic design, he had image making skills, he had he, had, he got the look right, he, he got everything right and, and created a really nice brand for these sort of couple of flyers he'd done. And we just want, you know, in fact, I employed him for two weeks to redecorate our office. And he did such a good job of that. Um, <laughs> everything was slight. <laughs> yes. no, but, but no, he was, he, his attitude was absolutely <laughs> first class, which is why he's, his drive and determination drove him on. He got sick of the way I probably acted, without a shadow of a doubt and went on and set up a company doing what I kept saying we were going to do and never actually did. And he did all the things, a checklist, of, and got on mm. and did it. But that was because he had a brilliant attitude and, and, an, and a fairly nothing, hardly anything as a portfolio. But there was something. I mean, I've, had, I've seen portfolios from people from this college who they put everything they've ever looked at in. And it goes on. For, I mean, you thought my talk goes on. I've looked at portfolios that go on that long. And it's kind of like, all right, all right, I get it, I get it. And it's, you know, it almost it waters it down. 
put your best two pieces in and be passionate about them. <laughs> Don't just waffle on about, and then I did this. Oh, my tutor said I should put this in, and I think it's crap. It's old, but don't put it in then or listen to what you know they may maybe know more about it than you do learn but at the end of it i was like yeah just get out you know that's 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 losing on both of us when i went to what for my very first job interview i um i had my big like giant portfolio i also had a box with all scale models that i had done like over the years because I, I didn't really know what to it, it was for uh, it was for a, a, a multimedia multimedia design jobs web designer basically and um i didn't know what to bring and i would because we didn't we 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 never like we, I, we only did web design in like the last two or three months before we graduated and it was like page mill and give builder so it was all like I'll make an animated GIF, and I'll and I think Photoshop had a layer limit of 99, so my animated GIF was basically a 99 frame loop, and I printed out everything because how do I take this stuff with me? So <laughs> I printed out my website, my GIFs, my, I brought books that I made like models and like waddled into like the kitchen of the of the company, and the guy was like um, the guy who who then like a couple of hours later gave me a call that I was hired. He, he went through all the things and I was like, so what do you know about web design? I was like, I know page mill. And the guy was like, right. Well, if you, if you get hired, you'll, you'll get used to, you know, what you really use. It was like Dreamweaver, like, you know, BB edit HTML, like how, how proper, proper um, um, software. But it was like, they weren't really that interested. They didn't, they barely looked at my portfolio, just like one or two pieces. Um, and they just like you know they talked to me and they just wanted to gauge me and the, the, the one thing the creative director he came in and he said it doesn't really matter if you're good at web design or like you know good at what we do here you'll learn all that you'll learn the ins and outs of the business uh, how to how to do things from a technical point of view but the fact that you stay through college so stay in college finish your course um, he, he said the fact that you've managed to do those four years, do your full degree, shows that you're like, you know, when you commit something, you can kind of follow through. Not like, you know, you drop out. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but he, he, he kind of like, that was, that was the main thing. He, he said like, you know, you need to commit, if you come to work for us, you need to commit to something, you know, work on a project from start to finish. And that, I guess they saw that in me and then, then um, yeah, that's how I got my first job. Not because I was good at anything that they were doing. I couldn't design websites. I had no experience in any design that they were doing. But yeah, so I guess attitude with, I don't think the, I've, I've noticed that when I went to, like when I go see graduate shows, I become really assy and I'm just like looking at the ones like, sucks, it's not aligned, this the fonts, blah, blah, blah. And I kind of like have to take a step back and think like how I was when I when I was in school. Like I didn't know anything. I just was trying stuff, trying to find my voice, and then go out there. So I think in 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 a, like a commercial sense, like working at an agency or starting to work at an agency, your work out of school isn't necessarily going to be the best of you, but it's going to be like the first really rough brush strokes and that combined <coughs> with a good attitude will probably get you hired, I guess. Actually, I haven't really hired that many people myself. Yeah, it's difficult. I think it's really difficult because uh, I was gonna say, I, th I think that uh, sort of ideas, intuition yes. and personality would yeah. be the things that I look Yeah, But the, sometimes, you know, you. The, the, the people that you're talking to haven't been taught very well. And I'm not yeah. you know, saying anything there. No, but, no, and so right. you have to kind of, you have to engage in a conversation to work out whether they kind of have that capability yeah. as well. I don't think you need, you need to be delivering like perfectly executed like no. Swiss typography. Um, you, well, you'd be coming to the wrong place if you did anyway. Um, mm. But... It's for me. That's what I would. I would it's it's, yeah, it's you, just, just insights. Yeah, in, exactly. In, yeah, yeah, and ideas. Ideas. Yeah. You know, because even if you can't execute them 
properly, you're in you're in a place where you can learn the skills that you need to in order yeah, to do that. You're never gonna. Oh God, I don't know how to execute things properly. You're you're probably you're never gonna work alone alone. There's always something that you'll need someone else. Program a website, do editing, do even design. Like you know, you design a font, then you have someone else like really going in, like a specialist, like fine tuning everything. So you don't need to like go out there and thinking that you need to know everything to get a job because you'll usually find what you're good at and specialize in that, and then everything kind of follows and, and builds, grows around the, the stuff that you're good at and what you like to do. It's quite good to go out wanting to do everything, but quickly yeah. realizing that you're never going to be able to. No, and then you kind of find like the stuff that you really, really yeah. are into, and you start to fine tune that. But you still, yeah, yeah. I kind of, I do like to do different things, but I know I'm not like, you know, I used to, I used to like hand code all all the front end code for websites when I was still at Claver. Don't want to touch code anymore if it's for a client project. Because I know I'm too slow and I just, it's too stressful for me. I'd rather focus on a design and then do some, like, keep coding, but for myself on my own website. Just to keep, so I know I can, st I, I can talk to a developer and I know what's going on. But, you know, you don't really need to know all these specifics. What kind of drifting are we? That's all right. I'll bring it back in. I'm, I'm, I think in terms of your ideas, what, what do you think is important in terms of when you're developing your work, you know, where do ideas come from, to, you know, from all your points of view, where do they come from, where's the initial starting point, does it start with a, a spark, and an idea you stick with, or, or playfulness, or anything, a commission, yeah, I'll, well, no, okay. I'll say client based work. Right, know, so I start. think the, the most important thing to do when you first get a brief is to question the brief, and mm. make sure the client's got it right, mm. and make sure that they know what it is that they want. Because unless they know what it is that they want, and I think you, you should chuck other stuff at them and say, have you thought about this? You give them the full um, yeah. the benefit of your experience um, and you listen. Uh, you listen a lot and reading between their responses, you can represent their brief to them in a way that you feel is doing it more justice yeah. um, and in a way that you feel that you can deliver a, a better um, Response to them, both creatively and technically. Yeah, I would yeah. argue. Yeah, turning it turning it into. I, I always try and find out what what is the problem that they want to solve. What is it? Why why are they sat in front of us? The brief that's written. What is the aim for it? What what do they have a problem that exists that, that needs this to be the solution? Because sometimes they come to us and go, we need this, and it's like, why? Why do you need it? I mean, it's great, you're bringing us work, but we, we've done work, we've started jobs for clients, and they don't really need it. And these jobs will drift on for months and months, yeah. and you might get paid a little bit, and then the job will just get cut, because there wasn't really a job there. It was someone just said, oh, I'll tell you what, we need a new X, Y, and Z. And someone will have taken it and come to a design studio, and you start working on it. But because you've never stopped, you just kind of drift into it. You Like you say, you need to stop and find, what, why are you doing this? I mean, sometimes, you do end up without the job, mm. but that's rare. I mean, mm. it's rare for them to do this that yeah. thing that I just said. But it sort of, it's you know, it does happen, and that is because they've just not thought it through. Well, they don't actually know what the problem is. No, themselves, they, they, they haven't worked. It. They, the they sort of, they, they've had a meeting, mm. and someone's come from that meeting and repeating some stuff they've had, and they've written something down, but they've they've not really understood what the problem is that needs to be solved. So you help them, like you say, you help them go back and just, you know, what, what, what is it you need to get out of this? What is the ultimate aim? Is it for this purpose or is this purpose? And in some instances that can actually scare a client off them when you come back to them and well, you can if they don't know too many doing, questions, yeah. right? But, well, but then you can't, you can't do the job no. for them, really, or you'll end up, we, we, we've started so many jobs that just wash around because, oh, I'll try it in mm. blue, or oh, try mm. it in this, mm. that, that you were looking at the wrong things. <clears throat> And not getting your teeth into what the problem actually is. I think if they're going to be a good client and it's going to be a relationship that you want to continue, they'll really respect you for your honesty anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've turned around yeah. to clients and said, Look, do you realise how shit you look? Yeah. Um, 
just do, you know, I mean, it's rudimentary stuff. I mean, yeah. going to clients, having Googled them, and the first thing that comes up is like a picture of a wheelie bin outside their head office, um, and presenting them and saying, this is, you know, which is quite a strong thing to, to go into a client and say, this is, this is how you're projecting yourself into the world. Yeah. This is, um, but I think, yeah, you, you, well, you want to get off on the right foot, don't you? And if it's not right for that job, then they'll come back to you with another one, mm. or they're not the right client for you. So yeah. do you find that when you're working on projects then um, that there is no linear process in terms of the way you approach a project or are you very much, um, you know, you will start asking those questions, finding out what the problem is and then you'll move on to the research and then maybe creating a bit of a prototype and generating some more ideas and or do you back and forward, you know, re-evaluating ideas and... We, we, treat, we treat every... We work with every customer completely differently, right? Because I'm not one for systems, right? Um, we have every every new customer. We had one come, came in last week, and I sit down around a table and just dis, just discuss stuff with them, discuss their business, and I get a feel for how I think they'll want to work. Mm. And the, the the last guy that came in wants to start a new brand for a furniture company, and I could tell he was very formal. He's good. He's going to be someone that's going to need. A, a very like a spec sheet and, and, and it's going to need like oh, the way we present it some people come in and I, by the time they've got back to their office I can have done the job for them you know because I just know I've got a feel straight away I know what's going on they want a quick logo they haven't really got much money so probably it comes back to intu intuition yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, and that's because of experience hmm. I can just I, I know exactly what they want I'll, I'll have that done sometimes I will prolong it for a few days because otherwise I can't charge them enough money <laughs> because they'll think hang on you charge me for a day's work but I got this so you know there is there is a few tricks but sometimes you know you just know that you you've got onto them straight away and sometimes that doesn't work you send stuff and you think oh, nailed it and then drags again they'll have got back and they'll have you know shown someone else at work who actually did do a you know a design degree and now mm. actually wants to sort of be the designer but can't actually do it so they'll just keep putting their oar in and we keep coming across those people the and wife doesn't like red yeah, or that, yeah. That, I mean it's su such a cliche but it happens so often you know you, you get mm -hmm. back to the bottom it's like why don't you want it to be this colour because it's mm. that's the right colour any shade will do but please don't do it yeah well and then it's kind of like yeah my, my wife doesn't really like sort of um, you know blue yeah it's kind of like, that well, reminds me of a story I'm kind of yeah. I'm kind of in 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 the process for potential new client, like full, full new brand identity, website, the whole the whole thing, and I've it's been going back and forth, like sending proposal, like first meeting them, like I got I thought I had a good feel for what they what they wanted. It's like they hadn't had their identity redesigned since ninety ninety seven ninety eight. So it's real, it, and it was done back then as a rush job that somehow stuck for like years so now like talking to them and they're like yeah not really knowing they know they want, they need it but they don't know how or what it's like well we don't want to use a circle because the circle is what we use now but the circle has equity people recognize the circle so i'm like okay i'll do some things and show them non circly things things kind of with a subtle circle just to have the connection <coughs> uh, can you do something else because the circle's been done before and it's you kind of you know and, and it's really dangerous those things to you need to be really firm with those clients and say like well you know it's you you we're talking because you kind of want to trust me mm. like you know you know that I know something that you need and you know I need your money and you need a new design, so we kind of need to work together. And hopefully, you know, with a couple of clients, you know, you can build lasting relationships that go on for years and years and years. And it's not always big jobs that come through, but you know, once you have like, you know, that honesty and that trust that you can basically tell a client like you're doing it wrong, or you know, vice versa as well. I think if you if you have a good client designer relationship that whole process of like you know getting a brief and then maybe me not getting it for the first time because I don't really get their industry at first or vice versa that they don't really they're apprehensive to go to make that step um, I think kind of losing my th train of thought here now I think one of the important things yeah. is what's really nice in a client relationship is when when you've got trust 
Yes. Whereas not only do they trust you, but you trust their alts. Like what, that when it's really, I actually do find it mm. quite quite rewarding when a client comes in and they say they they make a suggestion and you do it and it's like yes it is better now. Yeah. And I feel I feel. I that's a really nice thing because I think it's rewarding for them as well. But it actually, you feel that you've got a really nice bond with a client that can make good, considered suggestions. That and then and then when they do make one and you go, I tried it, it doesn't work. They don't start. Well, can I see it anyway? They'll trust you because of you. You have used yeah. their things and you. And it's that's a. We've I've got lots of clients, some good ones, some which we do tap for. But I've had them for tens of years because we've got mm. relationships like that. So in terms of um, research and the way that you approach, approach a project and sort of reinvigorating a piece of work and maybe finding that gem that may influence it or influence it or the wider context of a brief, what, how important do you think that is when you're actually taking on a project and making sure that you've done your homework, I guess? I think it depends on the project. I mean, I know that's a really crap answer, but I think some... Um, I think with something like a branding project, you really do need to do your homework and yeah. you need to think around the situation and not just uh, what's directly in front of me, what, not what boxes does it need to tick. Mm. Well, okay, yes, what boxes does it need to tick? But, um, you know, if, you if think, think, yeah. think, think, um, think about what that brand means, think of it as a personality rather yeah. than a mark. Mm. Um, whereas with something like, um, I would say, like a, a record sleeve or music video or something like that I think you can be much more intuitive yeah. and and be uh, have some uh, it, it, you know it needs to have some kind of emotional resonance rather than a symbolic it's more abstract yeah. Yeah. it's more abstract it tends to be more about the feeling and listening to the music it's a bit more ephemeral as well it's kind yeah. of it's got it's very place subjective it's kind yeah. of yeah. it's in and it's out whereas a brand yeah. needs to stand mm. but it also needs to talk mm. so you you, ha you have to put more work in it quite often we find the first thing we you know, the first typeface by intuition, the first thing we do, often ends up being a sort of version of what we end up doing. But we will try and push things so we have at least been honest with ourselves yeah. and tried everything mm. out just to make sure you have pushed everything everywhere that you can think it can go. And you, you know, you, you, I'll be working away some some evenings, and I'll actually sort of zoom out on my page, and I've got hundreds of variations of a logo. Mm. And kind of, I can't think what I was doing to get there. And I sort of look at one and look at another and bring them together, and I kind of mm. get a really nice feeling about it. Look at it again in the morning and say that was a waste of a night. I'll get, yeah. get cracking on that again. But, but I think, yeah, certainly with a brand, it's it's going to last. It's like architecture and, and what have you. It's got to have a, you know, you've got to put more work in the planning process and the building than just knocking something out. Mm. I mean, we do knock stuff out for people. That have you still do brand. actually produce branding as well at World Plastic, don't Oh, yeah, you? yeah, we, the, the we kept all the, all the... All the 12, 10 work has is, is basically been pulled in, all yeah. the, the good... The core work, stuff, yeah, the that, we stuff like, that we like. The so siphons. Siphons. Brought into yeah. <laughs> World Plastic. Yeah, it's basically, basically we, 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 let, we let all the account managers go, right. and, but they'd all brought boring work with them. So I said, right, you go off and set your own companies up, and they went and set their own boring right. companies doing boring work, and we just sort of cherry picked what we mm. wanted, and just two or three designers we just left and just got the nice stuff. And then the account managers realised afterwards and went absolutely mental what we'd done. But yeah, it's too late then. Um, we were already doing it. But um, I think I forgot what I was on about. Which is not well, right. dead 2D work and the oh, yeah, we, we, branding, branding yeah. and advertising. Yeah, the it, it, it comes into the footage you're taking. Is, is showing off the identity anyway, isn't it, really? Mm. You know, like you're designing the whole package. Well, yeah, the, you've got... The, the bike manufacturer, you're creating... Yeah. You know, it's creating a feel, it's creating yeah. a... At the, at the time, and still, the only thing they've got is a website they sort of didn't put much effort into about five years ago. So <coughs> us doing that actually gave them something coherent that then got put on people's blogs. Mm. And people don't, people don't really go to their site much. But they'll go to other sites. They'll go to other blogs that they You'll trust, that. and, and mm. you know it's on selectivism. It's on all the sort of big style blogs, and it kind of lifted their brand into a sort of back into sort of a stylish kind of status. <coughs> which because because we'd done a video that did that for them, and without that there wasn't brochures don't really exist in that way anymore. Mm. A, a video is a, is the sort of new way of 
of kind of getting almost like an online look and feel out there. I mean, you can do it really direct, which is what they thought we were going to do, is in like, these bikes are £4,000 and they've got Shimano gears and blah, blah, blah. That's what I think they thought we were going to do. But I had no intention of doing that at all, not even cross my mind. It wasn't until afterwards they were kind of like, oh, right, that's what you're doing. But we'd done it by then and we weren't ever going to do anything else. Mm. And there was, you know, we'd got within a few weeks a few hundred thousand hits and it was, it was staff pick on Vimeo and it, you know, it helped us establish that we could do that kind of thing. Because we'd really, we'd done that a few bits and bobs, but it was kind of like, you know, it, it gave, it basically, we could show it to customers and say, this is the sort of thing we can do. It doesn't, it won't necessarily be like that. You know, it could be ultra modern, it could be, you know, slicker, it could be this, it could be that. But we'll do it for your brand, just as we had that sort of traditional feel for a traditional brand. Yeah. You're putting the, you're giving the brand life beyond the logo. I mean, mm -hmm. and I think that that's really important right now. Um, you know, to think that it, it sort of begins and ends with the logo. That little thing. You know, it's really. Um, I don't know if you know that Sky's branding is mm -hmm. leased to them, I believe, by Venture Three. So yeah. they essentially they they're managing it to a point where they oversee all output and sometimes that's quite you know if you're going in as a filmmaker working for uh, an, a, a brand that has that kind of um, control it's really difficult because mm. you can't you know yeah. there's it's a, it becomes a clash of personalities and I think you know if you're making moving image or or if installation or, or or whatever it is something that lives beyond the kind of fixed Iterative. Yeah. Now, to have a branding yeah. has to be thought yeah. of as a. Um, it's yeah. something that actually works across all platforms, yeah. and that it's got to be able to move, it's got to be able to tessellate, it's got to be able to all these different functions. Mm -hmm. It's got to have, so it can't just work statically anymore. More so, it's got. I mean, ITV yeah. was used as an example. I think you picked up on it. Yeah. I mean, that won an award anyway. I think that got the DNA award, didn't it, last yeah. year? It won some big award. Everybody must be familiar with the ITV logo. Best use of colour Shit channel, but TV. fantastic logo. Oh, yeah. You know, you can't, hmm? you can't knock it. Best the way use of colour type in a TV logo. Yeah. But it I think breaks was, certain yeah. rules, but it only works mm. when it comes alive, when it actually, you know, overlays yeah. or interacts with something. It creates the medium mm. of the, all the colours behind yeah. it, doesn't it? Has anybody got any specific questions? John? Well, they kind of say that every year that the market is going to be oversaturated and there's too many design students graduating and, and looking for work. Um, and there's not many good graphic design students. But, you know, well, maybe I mean, they're not, may, not, may every, not be Not every piece. graphic design student will end up being or chooses to become a, a, like a, a full-time designer. I mean, at least I don't know how... The, 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 the mentality here is for students that graduate, like that do something like design. It's like how fixated they are on actually making design their career. When I graduated, well, I, I, did, um, I did kind of design and crafts in high school, which was kind of a runner up to then go and study design proper at, uh, at college. And even, even back then, graduating high school, there were people that were just like, right, I've done my artsy fartsy stuff and now I'm gonna work in a supermarket. Mm. They're like, what, why? And it's like, well, I'm gonna settle down. I've got my high school diploma, settle down, easy job, easy money, family, 2.5 children, a dog, and that's it, that's life for me. In college, the same thing, like people graduated, you know, you're a graphic designer now, what are you gonna do? Something completely different. I've got a friend who was like, he's, he's a psychologist, decided to retrain at 33 years old to become a designer, moved from Canada to London. So, I mean, you're not going to be competing to every single graduate. The, it's, the market is going to be 
the pool is going to be smaller than you think, but still everyone that's in that pool is going to be really hungry for work. So I think to stand out, first of all, email the person, call them by their name. Don't go dear, comma, blah, blah, blah. Because then we know you've just been copy pasting, copy pasting. Yeah, it's nice, it's nice to feel that you're bothered, mm. that you've bothered that little bit to actually find out the right name. Yeah. Because if you're just going to do blanket emails, the people are reading them, they get enough of them to know when they are and when they are. And if you've got a bit of personal, but maybe the opening line is very specific, is very relevant to the person you're talking about. They do your research yeah. on that company. Yeah. Yeah. They, they love to, so companies and individuals love to hear you wax lyrical about their work and, you know, specific projects that they've worked on, of course, you know, at least show that you know who they are and how important they are to you. Do you know that company? Do you really want to work yeah. for them? I still do the same thing when I'm like, doing cold client leads mm. like email find the right person and then kind of invite them to you know i'd like to come and have a discussion because i've done these kind of things which might be interested because you doing you're doing these things maybe there's something in between that we can do together so the same thing goes for you know looking for a job you kind of need to you know you find agencies people that you really want to work with and you show that, you show that interest and, you know, you back that up with like, you know, I'm not just, you know, I do work that sits in the same sphere or that might complement what you're doing. And really good point, actually. That, and the, it, it, if, if anything, you, it'll show your eagerness and they'll almost, they'll tell you them, but then it will actually kick them into gear thinking, actually, do I want this person? Because if I send them to X, Y, and Z, they probably will take them because they are quite good. Yeah. And gives you a little bit of a, a nice G up. No, nothing, you're not putting them under yeah. any sort of gun to the head yeah. pressure, but it does but it'll, focus. But it also gives you a point of reference mm. when you phone them to say, I've spoken to so-and-so and he yeah. recommended yeah. that I come and see you. Yeah. Because this is, so it's, that's your way into that network. Yeah. Um, it is a really small industry as well. Yeah. I mean, every, yeah. Like, everyone knows everyone. I mean, I just met Dylan for the first time today, but we know all the same people and we kind of know all like a lot of agencies in, in like kind of our section of the industry. Same with, with Ian, like, you know, I worked with, you know, I worked at Output, Output worked, started, came out from 1210. So, you know, it, it helps to kind of network and like make sure you, you know, maybe one person can, that you know can be responsible for like helping you up the ladder just because you can say, I've talked to him, so. And I would also say, I mean, just following on from that, you know, if, ask, if, 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 they, if they feign interest or are genuinely interested, ask if you mind sending more, more work as and when you do it. Mm. Don't bombard them with it. But you know, ask yeah. them if you, you mind updating them if you if you do some more work. You know, because it might it might be that the, the position's not there at the moment, or but yeah. it might be. Um, you know, it might be a, good it's then. a good point that the, the time you're asking them for a job, the chances of that coinciding with a job being available, you've got to think of the chances. It, mm. It's slim, but if you're there and you're relevant, and occasionally send the odd email, let's say don't bombard them, you'll be foremost in their mind when they think actually we do we do have a position opening oh it's that guy who keeps sending the stuff he'd be right for this yeah. rather than think right let's go and because people don't like using these what they call the agencies for employment agencies yeah. they don't like i mean genuine good graphic design agencies don't like using them the sort of people that do use them tend to be graphic design agencies or design agencies that are run by accountants that don't really know yeah. a good design for ad, designer anyway. large ad agencies as well as that kind of which, which is, it can be valid work, but you've got to see that you're going to work for business people and not creative, I, I, which is... Yeah, I think at the graduate level as well, it's almost... Uh, uh, well, not it's, it's highly improbable that, that you'll be hired from, a, yeah. from an agency. No. I think as you get higher up the ladder, yeah. then you can sort of be speaking to headhunters and... Yeah. But, but I think you're, you're, on, first, yeah. you're first... I'd just say you need to get as much experience however you get it, you know, so if you can run on a shoot, for example, even if you're studying design, I think that's a really good thing to do. 
Because um, the people you meet on those sort of things, the, you'll be surprised how multidisciplined a lot of the people are on a video shoot or a photography shoot. You'll find that there are other people similar who, you know, who come from different backgrounds and they go back off to do their other thing. And it's all good connections. Like I kept harping on about most of my connections have come out of the clubland sort of scene of the 90s in Nottingham. Like so many of, of our contacts and, and long clients are ex-DJs, ex-promoters who've grown up and they're just people that you meet, yeah. you meet out and you, you talk to and you say you went down the, the right pub. You know, I mean, I, I'm currently, I say I've never got a job, but we're currently wanting to work for Rafa and I've tracked down the PA, who's a next door neighbor, the PA of the owner is the next door neighbor of a friend of mine. So I'm going to get in through that. Stalking. And I'm, exactly. It's stalking. like Sherlock, <laughs> just <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> and, and, and I've tracked down, you know, at Sky, um, the uh, cycling team Sky, I've tracked down a good friend of Dave Brailsford who runs it. And, you know, they've already put a word in. They're aware that I'm coming, I'm coming for them. They don't know what they're going to get, but... <laughs> But I'm currently developing something. We're going to go and film some guys cycling next week. I'm developing an exact, the exact thing I want to prove to them that we can do so they don't have to think, ah, yeah, but can you? I'm going to show them that what they already do, we can do something similar, maybe on a diff slightly different tip or with our own twist on it, but they don't need to, they don't need to worry. And that's what <coughs> you, you need to prove to your potential um, employers, that they don't need to worry about taking you on board your you're proactive, you're interested in what they do, you've, you've looked into, you find out where they drink, you go and sit in there, you slowly move closer to them. <laughs> um, I also think um, a quite a succinct portfolio is probably quite a good yeah. tip. So don't bomb, you know, don't Come go in, in with like a, a, I don't know, I'd, like, I'd quite like it if somebody came in with scale models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd find that for, web, for websites, that was a bit like pushing it. Do you yeah. think it's worth tailoring portfolios? Yeah, absolutely. Go to a particular yeah. Cult, uh, yeah, cool. company, make sure the work is similar to yeah. what they produce. That still in goes for like jobs the, now. Like so every work, time yeah. they go for a different interview, they change the yeah, portfolio. You pull a few pieces out, out yeah. put a couple of pieces in. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I know, I'm sure we've all done it, but I never do the same talk twice never do the same talk twice right so you know the, the talk i don't know how it is for you the talk i did today would have taken me five days to put together right but i feel that i owe it to that person if they're going to all those people if they're going to give me their ear and their time to have built something specifically com- for that how many companies nowadays would you i mean obviously including yourselves with your own experience do you think graduates are um, tending to kind of upload portfolios now or take them on a digital device or is it still, no, people really want to see a physical portfolio and things printed I, out. I personally, I'm not actually, I, I quite, the first thing I do see, if someone says something, I say, show me your, your portfolio website. Whatever yeah. method they've used, if yeah. they've used one of these WordPress ones, as long as they've dressed it nicely, because mm-hmm. that's a skill in its, in its own mm-hmm. right to be able to take one of these off the shelf things and make it your own and not mm-hmm. look like a crap WordPress um, one, I just want to see what aesthetic they're already, mm. you know, wh- whether or not we're even going to be on the same page. And if it's something vaguely right, then you kind of like, right, let's now open yeah. up the dialogue. And it's quite, you know, it, it's, it's sometimes it's nice to see people for the first time. I do remember someone sending in a CV, handwritten on lined paper, and I thought, this is a maverick. This is my kind of person. I like it. <laughs> and it turned out they were just rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Their portfolio, I literally nearly fell asleep. Well, I was sat just behind them. And I was just keeping my eyes open. They, but I genuinely thought that they've got something kind of, you know, they've gone for this quite nice job and they've <laughs> handwritten it in sort of on, on line pay. Oh, this, this, this could be brilliant. We do, in we my just, head, I had something. We do get some fantastic CVs in. And yeah. I mean, just like unbelievable. And that's the other thing um, is your CV. All the guys, that, all the graphic designers that I used to share a house with just after I graduated, or didn't graduate, whichever way you look at it, they all went on. They went on to, to start all of us. Um, one of them was San- Simon Sankarai, who became um, the head of design, um, he was, DNA D or something. DNA D president, a couple of years um, ago. Yeah. Um, one guy who did the, the titles for the um, trash, that thing that I showed you, he, uh, Merlin Nation, who worked at, um, uh-huh. up the resolution. Uh-huh. These were my housemates. Oh, Merlin's at Thingy now. Yeah, he's in Brighton, isn't he? Yeah, he's from Brighton originally. 
But they, these, I forgot what the hell was the point of that. me telling you that little snippet of information. Well, because it, it was like portfolios. Portfolio. Yes, Did the guy, know? the guy, Michael Stretton, his, put, his CV. Oh, Mickey. Yeah, Mickey. Yeah, yeah. His CV that he did when he left, straight out of college, he didn't need to show any work. If I'd got that, I'd have just been like, that's brilliant. It was just beautifully made. He he only made a handful of them and he just sent them to exactly the, he thought, I, I think he thought, I want to work in Manchester. So he did a bit of research, companies in Manchester that were like his sort of style that he would knew he'd fit in. And he only sent about six out. And I think he either got the first or second one, one that he got to. But it was beautiful, wow. handmade, just, just so nicely done. It was only an inkjet print out, but it was on beautiful paper all nicely cut down and you could you just held it and thought I'd like to keep this you know and for a, for a student straight out of college to be doing yeah. stuff like that you, you know that they're going to be good so would you advise students to do that take time to sure, yeah. design their designers yeah. design you see well, if you can't, different you're, way that's your, you you're branding yourself yeah. you're selling yourself you don't have to do all that I mean we get some that have pictures of people in the corners like how's that going to sway me you know we're, I don't need to see a picture of the person you know it's, the, yeah, the thing is about like yeah, being in in <laughs> in a design uh, like in in a design industry like sending a dry CV doesn't really mean as much as actually showing the work. I mean, you could have a list of saying like oh, you've worked at Wolf Holland's, Weidman Kennedy, like any uh, all big ad agencies like big names. You think like, ooh, then you actually see the work, and it's someone that maybe hasn't really. Like you know, or the work doesn't really match the I actual CV li li listing, and I think you know either if a designer sends me a CV that's a, it's a work document that goes. I mean, the minimum you you could do is like if you're a designer, is like put it in design, design, do some <laughs> yeah. do something with it, like show a bit of your personality. But then again, at the same time, you don't really need to list all your accomplishments necessarily you just show your 10 best pieces and maybe and, and, and a good intro like a, a cover letter or a message or whatever but i don't think that a classical a classic cv with like my software knowledge languages i speak my hobbies uh my hobbies five is always a good one yeah it's a creative thing isn't it you're not applying for a job as an admin assistant in a no. in a healthcare mm. sort of Place, you're going for a and you need to be creative with every aspect and the more you know if you're you're the not only is it look nice or as well just the way you present yourself the way the tone in which you set mm. maybe your, your opening sentence or one sentence those are all do, you yeah. branding yourself and do be really careful with your language like the, oh, please, and, and please grammar and things, everything right? because it's yeah. you know even if you have to get someone else to go through it we it's a dyslexic a lot, we yeah, always it, discuss this because it doesn't. It doesn't. Doesn't. Do you, I mean, if you're well. obviously if you're going to get a CV or a piece of work through and it's got spelling mistakes on it or they're, you know, mm. they are going to have to be amazing. Some things that way. Do you different. think having a um, as a bonus having some kind of uh, philosophy or manifesto or an understanding of showing their understanding of what design is down on paper that they can actually. Well, maybe, get maybe what it what means it, to them. Yeah. To them. I think, yeah. yeah, they don't need to tell us what design no. is, but they need to tell us mm. maybe what maybe you don't need to go on about it like I do. Just just a sentence mm. about mm. what it means to you, perhaps, mm. and you may get something. But nothing mm. nothing is more important than than the way they actually are and mm. what they can do. Mm. You know, their ideas that are going to back up what they can do, and, and and the creativity. The creativity is what you you're buying into which is sometimes it's the way that they do stuff sometimes it's the it's their approach sometimes it's the ideas that they show but it's, it's knowing that there's something there that can be nurtured certainly if they're a student you know you're not going to get a finished product you know you're not yeah. going to come out and be brilliant even if you it, sometimes that actually works against you yeah, I, I know right. a student who was who would, when he left his foundation the, 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 the people almost I think the people didn't even want to take him on the course because he's already, he's already finished he's already mm. like a finished mm. article he didn't learn anything through the you know it was all he'd already set himself up as I do this kind of thing and it was yeah. and he was too rigid and, he, and if he'd seen if he was the right person for that one job then okay but yeah. it, it felt too contrived but it's nice to get a little bit of rawness a little yeah. bit of kind of you know 
they're not too set in their ways. Mm. Yeah. I know a guy who um, who left college and pretty soon went straight into a very good post house. He kind of bypassed the whole running thing and almost went straight on to operating uh, at quite a high level. But he would do stuff that the client hadn't asked him for just because he thought it would look better. And that, that not only upset the clients, but you know, he'd also trodden on so many toes to get to that because you know the traditional pathways however many years of the runner and how many every years as a sort of um, machine room monkey um, yeah. it's I think you have to be you have to show potential in fact in some cases it might be better you might be right it might be better to hold a bit back yeah, yeah. Um, and, and leave room for conversation because I think that's what everybody wants yes. to engage in right I'm going to open it up one more time for kind of s- summarise any more questions. Anybody got one more question? Really, really good question. Come on, degree students. How do you mean? Well, uh, for me, for example, I don't, I don't find it through sharing my ideas that happens yeah. to be popular. But when I, when I work at a design institution, I'm very polite. They'll say, don't be afraid of it. Having worked off it, it's almost a compliment. Because uh, obviously, you don't want your ideas yeah. stolen. How do you feel about that? I, say? I don't think it, I don't think it works in your favour if you keep all your work to yourself and not show anything or not share anything because maybe um, you know showing something that maybe isn't the perfect thing or something that wasn't approved uh, I mean something that wasn't chosen like just design concepts that you think are very strong and have merit you can just like share them post them on your portfolio blog about it whatever but I think keeping everything close to your chest just because you think someone else might you know see something in what you've done and do a better version of it is I mean it's, it's there's always going to be people that are either smarter than you faster better at like you know drawing typography whatever so I don't I don't believe in that you know being scared to share like you know lose ideas there are your ideas there you know you have made those things so why not show them why not um, you know yeah I think there's an argument to make sure you show it at the right point. Yes, of course. Um, so you, you don't need but, but, to show but, like sketches of a thing that you're still working on before yeah. it's actually finished. But I, I think there's a lot of merit in the kind of whole open source view yeah. of, of I mean, ideas. If you're going mean, to learn anything today, and you know, this has come from all three speakers, today uh, one of the key themes that's come out of all three talks is the, the idea of collaboration. And you can't collaborate, and you certainly can't open a collective you know, tomorrow, uh, how successful they've been is from, you know, having creatives in the same space, kind of working on ideas and just, you know, the playfulness of it and the experimentation and, you know, and the same with Ian, Ian and, you know, experimenting with video footage and, and you know, just dis- discussing ideas with his team or Tom working mm-hmm. for different companies and collaborating with different people. Your ideas or your best ideas can come more so from having a conversation, you know, this hasn't really been planned as such. I mean, I've hardly referred to this. It hasn't been the old question, and I wanted it to be like that. That's been my fallback. But what what is great is that mm. kind of, you know, the, the discussion, and that's what should happen, having a dialogue and opening up those ideas and seeing what comes out of it. I mean, this is slightly different because it's for you, to help you. But but I think, the you know, the, the, the pathways that and opportunities that those conversations open up uh, are much more. Um, there's much more benefit to th- for that potential than there is danger of you being, yeah. um, you know, ripped off. I mean, this uh, yeah. so so very few ideas are brand new anyway. Um, yeah. The idea that I mean, the notion that you might have a whole bunch of them that people yeah. haven't seen before is a bit naive. Check out Braun and Johnny Ives. Yeah, Br- Johnny Ives won the best product designers in the world Sir, Sir Johnny Ives and, and his stuff is very very you know Braun stuff 
he's co- you know copied it quite closely, yeah. but in a beautiful way that's taken it on. You can only be the best you can be. You can't what you can't worry about other people taking stuff and and. Th- th- People will come to the same conclusion about ideas that you've done anyway, completely by coincidence. I mean, there's, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't worry about it at all. I'd be, I'd be, it is a compliment if someone thinks your idea is that good to nick it. But if you've only got the one idea and you're holding on to it, then you've got to think about you, what you're doing yourself. You want to be, get that idea, get it out there, someone's nicked it, right, well, bad luck, I've got a better idea because two weeks I've been thinking about that. You know, it's given me an opportunity to start, as that one's now been taken, we're now going to go. We've done, we have that with clients where we get halfway down somewhere and they, they rock up or send me an email going, somebody else has done exactly what we were going to do. Yeah. Completely like coincidentally, I mean, very close. Yeah. Think, right, okay, we'll start that other idea we had. Let's now work on that. And you go off on a, on a different way or you take it somewhere else. And that's, that's you developing ways of working <coughs> and ways of thinking and ways of decision making. I wouldn't worry about sharing ideas. It's good, it's nice to talk to people. I think the only instance where that might not be the case is if you have a very specific kind of product design, yeah. uh, where where you where the when it's yeah. like yeah. where you have the intellectual like property yeah. becomes yeah. like an issue. But I would say within graphic design, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's the, I think Jonathan Barnbrook mm. says nothing is new except interpretation. Yeah. yeah. Well, the thing like when I, earlier when I was showing work, when I showed the slide of the zero paperback with like the paper torn and everything to build the cover I thought like you know this is like you don't see like you know I buy comics pretty much every week just looking at what's out there you don't really see there's like comics have this really regimented artwork logo that's it next one drop shadows you know there's not there's not a lot of like kind of invention or like thinking a bit further um, in, in terms of like comic covers so I thought this is, you know, the whole idea behind like tearing it up, like layering, like revealing stuff, revealing shards of the story. Oh, cool, nice, make the, uh, design the cover. Then I find out that in the mid '80s, I found a cover. I think it was, um, it might actually have been like a Arch Spiegelman uh, cover for Raw magazine, Raw, yeah. and it was the shards issue, and it was like <laughs> a face, like torn up. But it was like one one single face, like drawn in different styles, but all like torn, and you know, it, it there was like a similarity. But I wasn't gonna go like, oh shit, now I have to do everything all over again. I mean, I, I kind of like that tw- twenty years. I think it's easy when you're apart. young to have that despondency with things. Yeah, as soon as you find like, something that's been done before, you immediately go. Oh, but and everything then you is give done up before. And you I don't mean, do if it. you, yeah, it's an attitude. I, and I think you should look at it in flattery both ways, actually. Because mm. yeah, if you've come up with the same idea as somebody that you really like, like, you know, without yeah. without having seen it, then you're in. You know, it's the same. Yeah. It's just a mirror of of somebody coming up with your idea or taking your idea. But then yeah. I think it's only like what you say if you're working on really specific IP, and somehow someone beats you to it, coincidentally, or they really like competing. Then I think it would be an issue, but just in cases like this, it just happens. Um, yeah, not every like what you say. All, all ideas are pretty much. It's all about reinterpreting things and trying to find fresh angles to look at the same thing, and 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 then do something interesting with it that kind of fits whatever brief you're working to. So just to conclude, then, what what's the one bit of advice you'd, each of you would give to? The ones that have managed to stay. <laughs> well done for staying. Stay. You, yeah. You'll all get the oh, jobs. Cool. Yeah. You'll get the jobs, yeah. Most people. It. Stay hungry, yeah. stay happy. Yeah. What's one bit of advice you give them? Um, I one think bit from each of you. Uh, patience and perseverance. Because I, you're never going to get, or it's very rare that you're going to get the thing that you want straight out of the, straight out of the gates. But it's, you know, being a designer, like being a creative person, you're always working. It's like it doesn't stop. And, you know, I I wanted to work in comics when I was a kid, when I was a teenager. And then somehow making the right decisions, meeting the right people, dumb luck. Now I'm kind of doing comics in a way. And, yeah, if you if you really want to do something, just keep at it. Don't give up. You'll, you'll do it and kind of like force it don't wait for other people to kind of give you the keys like make the key yeah people aren't going to headhunt you they, they, 
the, the, you do, I mean, obviously, I, I've just been proved wrong because uh, she's been headhunted by uh, Microsoft, but generally speaking, you need to make that look. You need to get yourself to places. You need to, to, to make things happen. But the, it doesn't matter how good you are, you can get missed. You can get missed by someone who's beaten down the door, who's saying the right things to the right people. So, and keep it, keep yourself, keep yourself relevant, keep yourself fresh, so you don't get stayed, you don't, you don't lose your interest as you get older, and you get, you, you get, if you get a job, you know, don't, don't just sort of lose sight of what, what it was <coughs> you uh, became a creative for. Unless you land your dream job, don't make your live grief or day job be the be all and end all of no. your um, <coughs> interaction with design. So keep making stuff, keep questioning things um, and keep learning because it doesn't stop when you leave college. Brilliant, perfect point to end.